Good morning, David Yasko with you, August the 24th, 2022. Um, and uh, wow, it's, it's, it, I say it every week, it just seems like the year's going by quicker and quicker. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, uh, welcome to our midweek Bible study. We are studying about grace, and, uh, and I want to talk about the kind of grace that transforms us. And uh, and transforming grace, transformers really got a really got a makeover here back in the 80s and 90s and 2000s with the the transformer movies and you know how you could take something that was a car and do this 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 and turn it into a a, a, a monster or a or a, a good guy or a bad guy and and so it's, it's transforming is the idea of going from one thing to another. Now there was this fellow that was really good violin player and. And he uh, had gone away to study and had come back to his home city and, uh, and to give a concert to those that had helped him get through. And, and, and for the concert, he chose a really, 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 really difficult piece. Now, he had the whole orchestra and everything playing with him. And, and, and evidently, it was, a, it was pure genius. The people were, were, were amazed. And then he was playing one time. Now, violin's got four strings. And then he was playing, while he was playing, uh, one of the strings broke. Now, I'm a guitar player, and I will say that every now and then when I'm playing and bending and tuning and things like that, I'll have a string break. And, uh, and, and you really can't do a whole lot till you get that string fixed. And if you look at the, the folks today, the modern folks today, they'll always have one they're playing and one in it, one off to the side, just in case something happens to that one that they don't have to put a new string on. But they didn't have this luxury. Uh, this fellow only had one violin, and so he only had three strings. And to their surprise, he just kept on playing and uh, with a violin and three strings. And then, if you can believe this, another string broke. So now he's down to two strings. But you know what? He just keeps on playing, and he's playing, and I guess he put a little too much pressure on one of the strings uh, that he was playing, and boom, it broke. He probably should have changed his strings before he got before he did the concert. I would say that by now, if three of them broke. So now he's got one string, and he finishes the concert with one string and does it. I mean, he does it, and man, the crowd, you, they said you could hear the roar several several uh, blocks away uh, that's how that's how the 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 audience responded and reacted to it so after that was finished everybody got up to leave and, and because they figured well you know he did that he ain't going to play an encore with one string and he stopped them and and, uh, and he said where are you guys going you know normally after a concert with an ovation like that you you get a, you get an encore and so he said i want to give you an encore as he took that one string and he played the full encore on that one string. Somebody wrote, he made more music with one string than most people can make with four. Now that is some gifted, all right? Uh, some gifted, some giftedness in there that all that on one string. Uh, you go back to the 90s and you'll, you'll, if you want to look him up online, you read about a fellow named Christopher Reeve who was a was an actor played Superman in two or three of the Superman movies and he he loved in his spare time to do a sport called eventing eventing uh, it, it's a horse it's, it's it's a horse jump sport it combines the difficulty of cross country horse racing uh, with the finesse of show jumping and so you run this course and and, and during uh, one of these events and this is going back many years ago. Uh, he was uh, competing, and his horse approached the fence and balked. Now, what they what balking is is they just stop, and he was thrown off the horse and uh, over the horse's head and uh, and landed and broke his neck, and, and it paralyzed him. He became a quadriplegic, and uh, and before he died. A reporter sat down with him and, and, uh, and he said this. Let me just read this to you. This accident has been difficult for all of us. My daughter and I used to love riding our horses together. 
And one son and I loved to play the piano, and the other son and I would play tennis, and I would be kidding you if I said I didn't miss that. He said, ultimately, you must accept that being together is much more important than doing together. What a, what a great attitude, what a great example of having a good attitude in the face of a crisis. I guess you could all say that at that point it boiled down to Christopher Reeve and one string. When she was a little girl, an assassin took her father's life. Because of her name, Caroline Kennedy, she lived her former uh, formative years in the spotlight. And when it all got too much, she could always find comfort in the presence of her mother and her brother. And in the space of three years, she lost both of them. One to cancer, that would be her mother, and her brother in a tragic airplane accident. And yet we saw her strength and her attitude carry on. You see, you had Caroline Kennedy and one string. Let me ask a question. Do you think we have a tendency to spend too much time fo focusing on the dangling strings of our life? I mean, the inevitable things that get us, all of us, when we least expect them and definitely don't need them. Things like the car starting, not starting when we're late, or a marriage that breaks up, or a flat tire on the way to the airport. And we sit down and we determine after we get to a certain point in our life that there are inevitables in life that we cannot avoid. So how do we play the symphony that's called life when we only got one string left? Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 is where we're going to be for a while. And he says, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. See, God says the way to have the attitude of Jesus Christ is to live our lives in such a way that we allow God's grace to transform us, to take us from one thing and put us in, make us another thing. So how does God's grace transform us? Well, let me give you some steps, four of them to be exact. Number one, step number one. Step number one is this. If we want God's grace to transform us, we've got to learn how to change the way we think. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not change yourselves to be like people of this world. Be, be changed within by a new way of thinking. Then you will be able to decide what God wants for you, and you will know what is good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. You see that word changed? Literally, to be transformed. It's the Greek word that we get the word metamorphosis from in science class. If you remember, you used to take a caterpillar and put it inside of a mason jar, poke some holes in the the lid so it could breathe in a few days, it had transformed or metamorphosized into a butterfly. Same thing. God's grace can transform us from people of the world into people of his word. I, I, I read a, a joke one time that I was I thought was funny about this fellow that uh, he, he was from the mountains of Guatemala. He, his wife was... Um, uh, him and his wife, they'd been married 20, 25 years. They had a couple of kids. And and uh, and one day, um, he just happened, lived up in the mountains, didn't get down into the valleys much. But one day, um, found a brochure for Disney World and, uh, and looked at it and looked at it and thought, man, I want to go there. I want to take my family there. That's going to, that would be fabulous. And so he saved and saved and they saved and they put all their money back until they got to the point where they were able to make this trip. First time he had ever seen an airplane. First time he had ever been to the city. Man, he got in the airplane, left out of Guatemala City and, uh, and you know, up, up in the mountains and lived in a house that was Walls were made of corn stalks, and and uh, and they cooked on an open fire, and and so this was all new stuff to him. He saw things in there he'd never dreamed of. He saw people that he he'd never thought they were tall people. There were there were people that spoke Spanish. There were African Americans. There were and he got off the plane in Orlando, and his mind was just going crazy. And so he gave the address of where they were staying. They were staying at Disney and uh, in the complex and and the cab driver took them to the hotel and so uh he, he left his wife and and now you know she was a, a very typical guatemalan quiche uh, uh 
a woman in the sense that she was sturdy, and uh, and and her and, and the years had been difficult, so she showed that. And, and so him he left he left uh, her and one son out to unload the vehicle, and him and another son went in to to check in, went in to go in there and and uh, and, and talk to the people at the front desk. While he's waiting in line at the front desk, he sees this lady that probably in her mid eighties and, and, uh, and, you know, sort of, sort of shriveled up and, and, uh, and, you know, had a lot of wrinkles and stuff like that. And he saw her push a button on a wall and he saw these silver doors open up on a wall and he saw her walk in and the doors closed. And then he saw how the wall went from one to two to three to four to five to six, all the way up to 25. And then at 25, it started its way back down again. And it got down to one and the doors opened up. Now what went in was a, was a little shriveled up old woman. What came out was a very young, fit, tanned, in a bathing suit, blonde hair, uh, blue eyes. I mean, she was, she was everything that Florida is all about when it comes to tourism. And, and he looked at that and he was just impressed. How in the world could a machine take somebody that was old and turn them into somebody that was young? And he decided, I don't know how it's done, but he said to his son, I want you to go get your mother and run her through that thing and let's see what she looks like when she comes out. Uh, and, uh, and so now I want you to know between you and me um, that, uh, that, that that was a very shallow man. Okay, I just want you to know a very shallow man. But his thought process was pure. He says, if I could put something unappealing in a room and turn it into something that's very appealing, then there can be transformation. Now, personal change is all about our attitude. An attitude is all about what we put in our minds. An attitude doesn't have to be heard to be there. It can be seen. If you don't believe that, leave the church building or leave your house and, and, and go to the first traffic light. And when it turns green, just sit through it. Don't go. You won't hear a lot of bad attitudes. You will see a lot of bad attitudes. And, and, uh, and, and so sometimes, and there are some people who kind of enjoy their bad attitudes. You call them a jerk and it would be a compliment. And, uh, and I was talking to a fellow one time and he says, you know, I like my bad attitude. I like being a jerk. It gets me things. And it's true. Having a bad attitude will get us some things. Now, when I was growing up in Lubbock, I worked at a hamburger joint and we'd have customers that came in there with bad attitudes that would make our lives miserable and it always got them something extra it's amazing what you can hide inside a hamburger bun <laughs> they probably wouldn't have wanted what they got extra had they known what that extra was look other people do not create our spirits other people reveal our spirits now let me give you the three things that give us bad attitudes and we'll sign off for this week number one uh, is the thoughts that we think Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your thoughts, for they are the wellsprings of life. Now, when you think about what runs your life, let's say you've got a Corvette. And I mean, that Corvette runs on premium gasoline, okay? Can you run regular unleaded through that Corvette? Yeah, it'll run. It just won't run up to its potential. See, we're the same way. We are high-performance creations. When we think bad thoughts, we do not run to our potential. Now, the second creator of bad attitudes is the company we keep. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, bad company corrupts good character. King James Version says, bad company corrupts good morals. Uh, another version says, bad friends will ruin good habits. In the business world, they tell you that, uh, that, that the people we surround ourselves with are going to determine our level of success or failure. That means our friends are either making us or breaking us, whether we're in the fourth grade or 40 or four score and 10, it, it's not just a verse for our kids. Whether we're in, we're, we're the, the, so the third, the third attitude maker is the problems that we possess. Now, let me give you something I ran across that describes all problems. All problems are, we're spelling out the word problems here, P, predictors. You can predict your success or failure by how well you respond to the problems you have. R, reminders. Problems remind us that life is tough and we're gonna need God's grace to get through it. Oh, opportunities. 
problems give us opportunities to learn new ways to grow. B, blessings. Problems are blessings because we learn more through trials than we do at any other time. Now, let me just put it in a, in a, in a nice example, okay? Rubber bands and people have one thing in common, and that is they both have to be stretched to be effective. L, lessons. You know, if we let them, we can learn so many things from our problems. Probably one, the one person in the Bible who was the example of how not to take this to heart was this fellow Samson, because he refused to learn from his problems. He kept running around with the people he wasn't supposed to, and he kept getting in trouble for it. And, and, and the thing was, it was always somebody else's fault. It was always everybody else after him. It was always, it was always they didn't like him. There was a witch hunt. It was always one of those things. It was, he, his life had more twists and turns than a soap opera. Uh, you know, I, I guess you could say that as the world turned, Samson was one of the young and restless hanging out in the dark shadows with only one life to live, having all my children at Hebron's General Hospital. In his search for tomorrow, he ended up on the edge of night trying to find his guiding light. It took me a while to think that up. I'm just going to take a bow right now. Thank you very much. That was fun. Now, he could have won an Academy Award, wouldn't he? Because in his last trial, he brought the house down. E, everywhere. Problems are everywhere. You have problems. I have problems. Nobody glides through life. Nobody coasts. M, messages. Our problems send us messages of where God says, I want you to grow. God is much more interested in our character than he is in our comfort. That means if we constantly have a problem in a certain area, God's sending a message just that's sending us a message that says, hey, you need some help. And then solvable. In the light of the grace of God that transforms us, there is no problem that is too great to solve. See, what has God, what God has done to us, God wants to do through us. He really doesn't care where the problems are taking us. He really cares where we're going with them. We're going to stop right there. We're going to have a prayer. And next week, we will look at the rest of this class. Let's pray. Our God, we come to you right now asking that you be with us and bless us. Father, I ask that you be with those, Father, who are hearing this message or watching this message. Uh, Father, that are in countries that um, that have that have hunger issues. Father, we have plenty of those in our own country. So, Father, I ask that you bless this message that it goes out and that it reaches and it helps somebody plug themselves into you and change their lives for the better. Through Jesus' name we pray.